one of the problems that we have run into when paramedic students enter into the program is that they're overwhelmed with the amount of material that is, that is just regurgitated to them on the first day. So, or first week of class, take your pick. Um, so one of the problems that, that we've had is that, oh my gosh, I forgot what exactly is the purpose of this whole portfolio, whatchamacallit, that, that they talked about in class. So this is that overview to give you an idea of what you need to do. I need to do what? And we'll give you the background as to where we came to, why we've done it, and why it's going to be a better process for you. And it's going to be something that is going to enable us in the future to really demonstrate that we, in fact, as an EMS profession, have shown competencies. The National Registry exam, the ALS version, consisted originally for the psychomotor part or the skill part, consisted of a student going through about 12 different skills. In each of those skills, they were taught this material through the program. And then in one day, at one time, that individual is now evaluated. And a problem that we have all complained about is, is that I've had students, other educators have had students that have been awesome through the program. And then all of a sudden they get to do it in IV on a piece of plastic in a classroom, on a table, with a Sharps container sitting right beside it, and they're just not comfortable. And they have to retest it. So it became this big issue of this is a snapshot in time. And when that snapshot was taken, how well were you performing? Wouldn't it be great to have something over time? And that's where that portfolio project has come in. But our old process, or the process that we have put in place now, or had in place, was to verify the competencies of an individual to be able to intubate a patient, put a superglottic airway in, such as a King LT or a combi tube for ventilatory management, put an IV into somebody, put an endotracheal tube into a, to a pediatric patient, put an IO into a pediatric patient, and then be able to evaluate you in one of three random skills. Now they're highlighted here in green because quite frankly, all you had to do was memorize the sheet. There was no challenge whatsoever. It was a word for word. As long as you did everything that was on that sheet, you were good to go. Then we start looking into some moderate thought. We had a couple stations that dealt with the moderate application of knowledge. Patient assessment trauma. Again, the majority of it was taking a look at, can I apply the knowledge? Can I do an assessment on a trauma patient? But it did require you to think a little bit more. And the reason it required you to think just a little bit more is because you had to make a determination as to whether or not the patient was experiencing a life-threatening issue and could you correct it? Could you verbally correct what was going on? So that's why it gave more of a moderate thought process. The dynamic cardiology is primarily dealing with a mega code, a code in which you are giving at least four different algorithms or four different rhythms that the patient is in and you're going to have to treat them. But you know that you're going to see a few of them so it kind of gives you the advantage that you can help determine your own fate in that aspect. The IV bolus medications moved into an aspect in which, guess what? you were going to give a medication, whether it was an epinephrine, whether it was atropine, or whether or not it was dextrose. And let's be realistic, if you finished up the program, you should know how to administer those things. And again, it was a snapshot in time. So it required a moderate amount of thought. When you move into something that is more of a higher level of thought, you start taking a look at static cardiology or the oral scenario stations where you really are going in there blind and it's truly, it's starting to make you critically think. 
if you don't understand in static cardiology that there is an EKG rhythm that you're going to have to interpret, you're then going to have to read a scenario and apply your own knowledge and verbally treat that patient, you're not going to do very well. The same thing happens in the oral scenarios. You are going to have to figure out what is wrong with your patient and treat them for what is wrong. You have to make that determination. And again, the biggest issue here was is that this is one snapshot in time. And it gave us a lot of times a false sense of security. We were taking a look at things that really were we looking at Bloom's taxonomy and saying, were we really making you prepared or verifying that you were prepared to be a competent entry-level paramedic? Or were we looking at the fast food giants advertising something and it really looks great on TV, but what actually came out of that wrapper when we opened it up wasn't quite what we looked at. That's where there's this big change that has occurred. We like to think of it as what are our dreams versus reality. We all know the reality here is that in this top picture, we have a patient who is on a table with all of our airway equipment all sorted out, ready to go. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen that. I've never seen a patient who laid on the table, put all of their resuscitation equipment around them, said, fix me. Have I seen it with this person that's here on the right? Absolutely. I have seen that individual. I've been those paramedics that have been there trying to manage their airway. I haven't had to put too many IVs into an arm where there was the choice of the medication sitting right in front of me with all of my material sitting out with an IV pole in place and a sharps container sitting right beside me. Most of the time my tape has been on my leg or it has been on a bag or it has been on the side of a recliner. It didn't get to sit on a table just like this. I wasn't sitting inside of a car trying to handle the patient and start an IV in that aspect. So the folks at registry and the folks that teach your program, teach our program, they realize that we're just taking a snapshot in time and we're probably not setting up something realistic for our patients or for our students. So the idea of a psychomotor, paramedic psychomotor competency portfolio is to assure your competency. We're looking to make sure that your skills are competent and we send you through formative and summative phases. So in that first part, you are taught in the classroom, you will be taught how to do a patient assessment. We're then going to, after giving you the background of a patient assessment, put you into practicing the skill. Nothing wrong with a patient, just ask the questions. Get used to conversing with a patient and try to figure out what's going on. We then add in a skill. We add in IVs. We bring in an IV and we've now built upon your previous skill. You've assessed a patient. You've now made a determination that oh, I've added a new skill that by the way, I've practiced in a lab setting and now I need to go into a scenario and really make a determination as to whether or not I should be putting an IV into a patient. These progress. These are those formative areas that we're talking about that we may take you to a point of, okay, you put an IV into somebody. Now what are you going to do? Well, I'm gonna run some fluid. Great. Why are you going to run some fluid? Because their blood pressure's low. Fantastic. How are we taking them to the hospital? Well, we're going to put them on a stretcher and we're going to make sure that they go th that you go through that process. But we're not going to give you anything more complicated because you've decided whether or not the person needed that 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 issue. Whether or not they needed that skill. You're going to get more practice with that in the clinical phase. And these overlap. So that when you're in the clinical phase, that you're learning how to establish that IV in a hospital, in the back of an ambulance, in somebody's house, 
in the ER, in the intensive care unit. That field phase has a capstone or field internship process to it where you are to serve as that team leader. And you have to serve as that team leader 18 out of 20 times successfully. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the whole, we got to make sure that you're competent to test. But these build upon one another, both that laboratory, the clinical phase, and that field phase. We're looking to see that you can take care of your patients. This meets requirements from the accrediting agencies that they look at the schools and they say, hey, are you guys meeting these requirements? And we can come back and say yes. This also means that it shows your future employers that you were qualified to test. It shows you that you're qualified to test. And that is what you're all looking to do, to test to be able to become a paramedic. Competencies have been addressed for a long time. Is it based on skills? Is it based on hours? Is it based on a number of contacts? What we know is that the more frequently you use those skills, it doesn't necessarily need to correlate into hours, but what is the quality of those contacts? And I will tell you that it goes a little bit beyond this screencast, but we're talking that the more critical thinking ability that occurs with patients in the back of an ambulance, the better your performance is on an exam. There are going to be ways in which you can identify your competencies. We're going to use those things through peer evaluations where your fellow students, your fellow classmates are going to help you through the process just like you are going to help them. There is a process of self-evaluation. And when your preceptor is giving you a true evaluation on the encounter that you just had and you compare it to what your own evaluation is, it's amazing how frequently they can mirror. But if I want to just go through and check things off because that's all, I, that's all I've ever done, then you're not going to get a fair evaluation and you really have to consider whether or not that's somebody you would like to learn off of. Where did all of these skill forms come from? National Registry put out at least 33 of them. In our process, we have made a determination and made recommendations for discussion to our advisory committee. Our advisory committee came back and said, you know what, you need to make sure that the skill sheets that are in that portfolio are going to include things that are necessary in our area. Things that are in the protocol. Can we verify that a, that a provider understands and knows how to use push dose epinephrine? Is it something that is going to be recorded necessarily in FISDAP, in our electronic, tra in our electronic training? No. Is it something that we need to make sure that is verified? Yes. Are we going to do that? Yes. But these are the skills that we have to make sure that you are able to do. This helps demonstrate your competencies. So it comes from your instructors, national projects. It comes from your committee, our representatives who bring in our students and they hire them. They've worked with them. These are folks that are making recommendations to us and say, we really, you need to do this and that's why we have done this so far. So you may see some changes with some of the forms that are here. Again, it's a whole process. We're gonna start you off in that classroom phase. And from the classroom, we're starting to move you into, now we're going to demonstrate a skill. So in this case, they were being taught the necessity of checking for a pulse. But the first time you checked for a pulse, did you understand how to check for a pulse? It can become a complex issue. The first time that you do it, you check somebody's pulse. You can find it. Now you're going to count it. And the instructor counts for 30 seconds and tells you when you need to multiply. Then the next phase is that we now make you look at a watch and your, or a clock. And now you have to make the, the determination as to when the 30 seconds are up. And now you have to multiply it. So we bring that into that, that laboratory phase 
and then we bring it into a scenario. What happens when I don't have a pulse? Am I going to do CPR? This is where you're getting into the clinical and into the field settings. And you're practicing these things. And eventually, what will happen is you will go out into that capstone process. You'll go out into that field internship area. Competencies are the measurable or observable knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors that are critical to, success, to successful job performance. So that means it's something that we must measure. And we've had questions before as to why do I have to document things if I was not successful? It shouldn't count. And the answer to that is, is that it has to be measurable. It is something that we need to take a look at. It is something that we have to be able to look at something, take it, and verify that over time you have learned this process. And those peer-to-peer -peer evaluations, we're utilizing validated forms. We're using forms that enable us to score somebody. This is the expected standard. You go through this, if there's frequently missteps as a peer, you learn from it. Because you realize you've seen the errors. You've marked down that somebody has messed that up. And you come back as a group, as a team. And you help each other with their weaknesses. If there's just a sign-off, guess what? If you just check off all these forms, you're going to fail too if they do. So that means you're going to have to redo the skills again. So that means if your requirement for the program is 10 intubations before you're signed off by an instructor or verified with an instructor, and 10 people have signed you off, all 10 people are going to have to go back through the process again. It just makes sense. It makes sense in the way that we do it, and it works. One of the problems that we'll probably run into is helping to verify competencies because everybody thinks it's a numbers game and there are numbers involved, but the numbers that you're thinking about, a percentage doesn't always cut it. 80% of the last 20 attempts starts to show from a scientific basis that you're competent. We know that some people are going to be competent sooner than others. In this case, this individual had 50 attempts at an IV, but at 21, they were shown to be competent. This individual had over 102 attempts, but it took him 80 times to get this correct, to become competent in it. Somewhere along the line, something happened. Now, people have said, you know what? They had bad veins. That person had great veins. They were in a well-lit condition. They, pick and, they picked and chose their people. You know what? You can go in and take a look at that. But our patients are our patients. So the difficulty level on some of them can become a problem. And therefore, we have to account for that. We look for things, again, that are measured. We're doing summative evaluations after we have been able to document the formative phase that you've been able to identify how to put that IV in, when you need to put that IV in. And pretty soon it becomes part of that summative. You're thinking, yeah, an IV, okay, I can do it, no problem. We start to look at the presence or the absence of those critical thinking skills. Again, it is to help you. It is to help you recognize areas in which you need to improve. You are here to learn. If you knew all this stuff, you would not be here to take a paramedic program. This is applying everywhere. This goes to all phases of learning. We're looking for that measurement process. The advantages that we have here is, is that you're dealing with real patients. You're dealing with supervision. There's always going to be feedback. There's more control over the whole thing. And we can put these things in a variety of settings. We can try to simulate so we're going to move from a skill to a scenario and we're going to add more realism to it. Yet there are disadvantages. 
the number of times that you're going to have to do things. We know that the time for us to teach you to do different things is going to be reduced. So that means that we're going to have to have you do stuff outside of the classroom and come into class and be prepared. The preceptors, what one does versus the other one is going to be a little bit different. The different settings that you may run into, a high volume hospital or a specialty hospital versus a low volume hospital that is not a specialty hospital. What is the complexity of the patients? Do you get observing or performing? So one of the problems that I've always run into is I have a student who goes to the operating room and there's a pediatric patient sitting on the table and the nurse anesthetist or the anesthesiologist says, this is a pediatric patient, you're not gonna do this one. What better time to learn? That nurse anesthetist or the anesthesiologist is not going to be with me when I have to manage the airway of a pediatric patient out inside of a car and when it's three degrees below zero out and it's snowing. They're not gonna be there. I need to be there, I need to know that I can do that. So that's where that disadvantage, we realize that it may be there. We're gonna have to move that and we're gonna have to challenge your critical thinking skills. How do you manage that child's airway in a vehicle that is upside down? Our skill forms are designed as a formative phase. They're designed to give you detail upon detail. This is how you perform the skill. So back to the preceptor area. Bad habits just continuously get transferred on. And in the glucometer skill section, in the glucometer area itself, it talks about prepping the fingertip with an alcohol prep. Getting a blood glucose off of a patient is part of an assessment skill. It is for somebody who has an altered mental status to help identify whether or not they're suffering from a low blood sugar, a high blood sugar, or are we rolling out in a hypo or hyperglycemic issue in somebody who has a stroke. So it is an assessment phase. It does not require you to start an IV to gain the blood sample. So this is where we need to make sure that we're following the manufacturer's recommendations. The standard of care, the standard of practice needs to be demonstrated in the classroom, in the lab, in the clinical, and in the field settings. All of the forms that we start to take a look at, we need to make sure that you will be successful and that you will be serving as a team leader and as a team member. You will be successful in 10 team member evaluations. We need to make sure that you are also successful in 10 team leader evaluations at the adult, pediatric, and geriatric levels. Those are the people that we deal with. So it shouldn't come as a shock. We can't just pick one versus the other. We will have topics in every area that you learn and we progress through these in the class. We have a lab manual that has been designed and many of the forms have been borrowed from other folks around the country. And we believe that we're putting this form together to help you. We've, we've talked to our previous students and said, what would you like in these forms as you've been progressing through? And we took their advice and we moved forward with it. So the lab manual will provide you with a lot of information, will provide you with all of the forms that you need so that when you go to log them into FISDAP, that you will have the ability to just transfer those things over. Of utmost importance through this whole process is to document, document, document. Even if you failed, you need to document it. This is the place to make the mistakes. Make the mistakes in the scenario, make the mistakes in the lab, make the mistakes in the classroom so that we can learn from them, move forward, and make you the best entry-level practitioner that you can be. Should you have any questions, please make sure that you ask one of us, ask any of the faculty members, and we'll be more than happy to help you through this process 
and it is a wonderful learning opportunity for you and the entire EMS community. Thank you.